when the Medal of Honor was presented to me, I really did not know what it was. Why was I selected to receive our nation's highest award when Marines right beside me didn't get home? I was born in Marion County, a little community, country community of Quiet Dell. My father died when I was 11. My mother was running a dairy farm in West Virginia, and there was no way I could possibly get an endorsement. So I came home, and I came home with the intentions of joining the United States Marine Corps to protect America, because if we're going to go to war, I felt that war could take away our freedom and our privileges, and I was going to be a part of protecting that. When I got home, I still was 17 years old. My mother would not sign my paper to permit me to go, so I had to wait until I was 18. I was 18 in October. In November, I went into the Marine Corps recruiting to enlist, and I'm only five foot six tall, And uh, the recruiter, when he looked at my paper that I'd filled out for enlistment, didn't look at it, really. He just looked at me and said, I can't take you. You're too short. So I went back to the farm. If I couldn't go in the Marine Corps, I wasn't going to go. I'd had two brothers already drafted that were in the Army, and I didn't like particularly that uniform, so (laughs) I want to look like a Marine. So... uh, in, that was in November of 1942. In early 1943, the Marine Corps, or the government at least, uh, lowered the height requirement that they had had of 5, 8, or better down to a lower height, and then they could take people that were not that tall. So the recruiter came to the farm. I'd gone back to the farm to work with Mom, and, and uh, he came to the farm and asked me if I still wanted to go. And I said, yes. So I went back to the office in town, and he signed me up, and off I went. Once we got aboard ship, then they brought out a board that showed the outline of what Iwo Jima looked like. And the words were used at that time, or maybe a little later, it looked like a pork chop. And uh, they told us that we were a reserve to two other Marine divisions and that probably we would never get off ship, that we would be reserved to them in the event they needed us, and uh, that the campaign would probably last no more than three to five days. That was the information that everybody apparently had at that time because we had no intelligence of what the island consisted of. We certainly didn't know they had 22,000 Japanese on it, Uh, We didn't know that they had miles of tunnels dug out in the island. None of that information was available. So um, when we got to Iwo Jima, we're parked out in the ocean waiting to see if they need us. And uh, on the first night, after losing so many people on the beach, uh, we were notified we will be going in the next day. And that was the 20th of February. And when we uh, got aboard the uh, Higgins boats to try to go ashore, uh, we went out and circled in the ocean all day, waiting for the signal to come in, and we never did get it because there was no room. There was no room for us to land. They had them pinned to the beach, and and uh, the there was no place for us to fit. To, to go when we got there. So we went back aboard ship and spent another night. Then we went in the next day and uh, landed. And when we landed, the ramp went down. We're all huddled down in the Higgins boat so we can see nothing on the way in. Uh, everybody is down below so that, that uh, you can protect yourself to some extent. And when they dropped the ramp, to let us, you know, exit the Higgins boat. Uh, the beach was just completely 
covered with all kinds of equipment, uh, blown up jeeps and tanks stuck and bodies and and uh, equipment laying everywhere. And one of the things that has always been in my mind, it'll be there as long as I live, that when we went off the Higgins boats, off to my left, and I'm sure everybody saw that, I don't think I was the only one, that uh, of the Marines that had been killed, they had wrapped them in their ponchos. Everybody had a poncho for the rain, it rained a lot, and uh, they would wrapped them in their poncho and just stacked them in stacks right along the beach edge. Uh, and I saw that. And uh, I've never lost that vision. Uh, we finally got through the soft ash that was there. They call it black sand, but it really is ash from the volcano over the eons. And uh, very uh, fine. It's not, it won't compact. It's like little BBs and and you could not dig a hole in it because you dig a hole, it just roll back in again. Uh, but uh, it was so chaotic. And we finally worked our way, crawled most of the way, but we finally worked our way up to the first airfield. We didn't know it as the under uh, rank people, but the objective was that we would become the spearhead on the island. We would, we would go across the airfield and be the spearhead to sort of split the island. We didn't know that until we got involved. But uh, when we got to the airfield, everybody is digging in. At that point, you could dig a hole because the ash wasn't there, it was dirt. And uh, we uh, were digging foxholes to get into. And all of a sudden, uh, the Marines around me began yelling or saying something about a flag, and some of them were firing their weapons into the air, standing up, shoot, just shooting into the air. And uh, they were all looking back toward Mount Suribachi, and we're about a thousand yards up the beach from Suribachi, and uh, I turn around to see what what's going on, and that was my first vision of the flag flying on Mount Suribachi. It was already up, and the wind was blowing it, and it had full, full unfold. And what did I do? Same thing they were doing. <laughs> I, had to, I had to join the group and start firing my weapon, too. You know, you got, you got to take part. <laughs> The reason I became the flamethrower operator is I had six Marines with me when we hit the beach, and I had two of them with each of A, B, C, and companies, but they're gone, and I don't know where they are. I don't know whether they were killed or wounded and still yet today, don't know. But I'm the only flamethrower now left in C Company, and uh, I'm an acting sergeant, I'm the guy in supply or back in headquarters that's supposed to keep them supplied with demolition and flamethrowers that they need. And since they were gone, um, my commanding officer, uh, Captain Beck at the time, he eventually became a major, uh, he called for a meeting of all NCOs. I, as a corporal, was not considered an NCO. And I wasn't going to go, but my first sergeant told me that he wanted me there. So we gathered in a huge shell crater. And uh, he was to work out, a, he was working out a system of how we could uh, get to the pillboxes that had us stopped. There was a string of pillboxes they had built to protect the airfield. And they, we couldn't break through them. There were just too many of them. And the Japanese is in the protected area. We're in the open area. So when we gathered in that shell crater, much of which had no particular meaning to me because he's, he's talking about plans. 
And But then he said to me, do you think you could do, or words to this effect at least, do you think you could do something with the flamethrower against some of these pillboxes? And apparently we hadn't tried that. I don't know, but uh, uh, how I answered, some other Marine said later on that I said, uh, I'll try. So he gave me four Marines to uh, give me some help, protect me while I'm trying to get to a pillbox and get flame in it. And, uh, and then uh, I select one other individual to help me with an explosive. We called him a pole charge man. Uh, if I burned out the pillbox, he used to run in and put a demolition in it, set it off, make sure everybody in there is gone. And uh, he didn't last but just a little while. He got shot through the helmet and, and uh, it didn't penetrate his head, fortunately, but he was out of whack for a little while. And so I just went to work. After we crossed the first airfield and encountered this great number of pillboxes, they were reinforced concrete pillboxes. And naturally, the enemy is inside in a protected area, and the only way we can get to them is to jump up and run away and hit the deck and try to get close enough. And the only target that we had was in the aperture that they had in the front of the pillbox that they used to shoot out of. All the rest of the pillbox was solid. So we, we would try and we would have to back off because they would get too many of us so we'd have too many killed or wounded. So when, when I picked up the flamethrower to eliminate some of the pillboxes, I was only doing that for which I was trained. Other Marines had trained me to do that. And had they not trained me, it would have been impossible. But by eliminating the seven pillboxes in the area in front of us, or at least eliminating the enemy within, according to what my commanding officer said, and I knew nothing about this, I'm a corporal, I don't, I don't know what's going on except in my own little realm, that it opened a lane that we could get through. And by in, once we broke through the line of pillboxes, we had the advantage because they have no way of shooting from the back of the pillbox. They can only shoot from the front of the pillbox. So they said that by breaking through that string of pillboxes, it opened a lane that gave us an opportunity to continue to advance and succeed in our operation. And uh, two of those Marines that day, I didn't know who they were. I just selected Marines. We were so disorganized at the time, we didn't know who anybody except our own squad was. And uh, these two Marines, I had no idea who they were, but I said, uh, come with me, and of course, as a Marine, you do what you're told. And two of those lost their lives that day protecting mine. So it absolutely changed my total life. Uh, I became a person I never dreamed of becoming. Uh, as far as I was, knew, when, I, when this war is over, and I never would permit myself to think I was not going to survive, if that thought even started into my brain, I would kick it out because I felt that I had to believe that I'm going to get back home uh, to a beautiful lady that I'm engaged to and I want to marry. So uh, I would never let myself think I wasn't going to make it. But when the Medal of Honor was presented to me, I really did not know what it was. I, even though the words may have been mentioned somewhere along the way by my commanding general, I still didn't know what it was. I had never seen one, never heard tell of it. And the day that President Truman presented it to me, I still had no concept of what it meant or exactly why am I getting this. Why was I selected to receive our nation's highest award? 
when Marines right beside me didn't get home. So it it was something that took a tremendous amount of adjustment. And I became a public figure at that point that I never dreamed of coming, of becoming. And I've had I had to live a different life than I ever anticipated. The World War II generation was a tough, committed, loving, country-loving, believing in freedom group of people. We were raised that way. We were taught that way all through school. Uh, it was it was something that our teachers emphasized constantly. And the historical parts of our country, uh, I had to memorize the Gettysburg Address and recite it time and time again because it had such a meaning that of people who had sacrificed their lives to maintain the one of the most precious gifts we have, that of our freedom. So the people today need to remember that if we ever lose it, we will never, ever be able to regain it.